Okay, um, this is our final keynote speaker for today, and I thought about jotting down a few introductory remarks, and then I suddenly realized there can't be a better introduction than being in a tornado warning uh, a couple hours ago, right in the neighboring counties, if you've been following the weather, real-time weather forecast. So um, what can we say about someone who studied tornadoes and mesoscale phenomena for so many years, and he's a good friend and good colleague? And so I just will say that both of us just got back from the field, so how he looks as harried as I did, because we just probably got back yesterday too, right? Yeah. yeah so we're, t we're in sync in that way. So we asked Howie to talk about mesoscale meteorology, and so what he's going to be talking about today is the scientific and observational challenges in mesoscale and convective scale meteorology. So it's all yours, Howie. Thank you, Roger. Motivation. I, I found this at the Kansas State Capitol. Uh, last week, there's a school teacher leading the students to shelter in advance of a storm. So that's supposed to be a lead-in to my talk. How do you study uh, phenomena like, for example, tornadoes? It would be nice if you could study meteorological phenomena as easily as this. Go up to the Mesa lab, surround yourself, and capture the tornado. The broad theme of my talk today will be the formation and organization of precipitating systems. I was asked to talk about mesoscale meteorology. And so this is what I'm going to focus on. Uh, the dynamics, the thermodynamics, and the cloud microphysics of convective storms, especially severe convective storms, and convective storms that are both truly on the convective scale and those that are organized into the mesoscale and their attendant phenomena. The important scientific questions involve the formation and the structure of tornadoes, formation of hail, microbursts, and other strong straight line winds, flooding, and I put in parentheses lightning really don't have enough time to talk about the electrical aspects of storms. One of the most uh, important problems in convective storm mesoscale meteorology is the initiation of convective storms. How do you know when and where a convective storm will form? During Vortex 2, we saw how challenging this was. We need to understand the dynamics, thermodynamics, and cloud microphysics of precipitation organized in the mesoscale, for example, bands, um, over level terrain, over the land, and also over the ocean. And then along with that, the mesoscale organization of precipitation over and near mountainous areas. I just got back from Vortex 2. Here's a typical supercell storm out in Kansas. And there's your typical tornado out in Wyoming, short distance north of here. And there's your typical large hail uh, in Missouri. Now, convective initiation. How do we study convective initiation? We need to know something about the wind field and the thermodynamic field in the vicinity of a region where storm may, may form. One way to do this is to take an airborne Doppler radar, map the uh, airflow along boundaries where lift occurs. This is an example of Eldora uh, analysis in clear air. So we need to have radar operating in clear air. Another thing that, that we can try is to use a uh, scanning radar, which we've done. And we've driven the, the, the radar on a truck, and we scan in the vertical plane. And by driving along and scanning in the vertical plane, you can look at the in clear air. Uh, you can look at the velocities at different, different viewing angles and synthesize the two-dimensional wind. You can also do this from an aircraft. This is using the Wyoming King Air aircraft. And you have one beam that looks down and one beam that looks off to the side, about 30 degrees. And as the plane flies by, you can do some pseudo dual Doppler analysis in the vertical plane. Uh, here's a, a, another case. I believe this is from IHOP. And if you focus your attention on the final product in the middle panel, it's a little hard to see. The vectors are in, are in white. You can see rising motion in this region. Uh, no rising motion in, in this region. And you also have the in situ sensors on the aircraft of the mixing ratio and the potential temperature. So you can see there's a boundary over here where the potential, where the mixing ratio, the um, specific humidity drops and the theta increases. And that's a region where you have rising motion and increased reflectivity, which is probably due to a concentration of insects. One interesting problem that occurs near the dry line is a mesoscale boundary separating uh, moist continental air, moist, <laughs> moist uh, gulf air from uh, dry continental air. This is something called the dry line bulge. And 
And the dry line uh, is not uniform in the north-south direction, but it bulges eastward in certain locations. And we think that there's a relationship between the dry line bulge and convective storm initiation. Um, how do you explain the dynamics of the bulge? Uh, you need to know something about the depth of the, uh, the moist planetary boundary layer. You need to make detailed measurements. Uh, there may be a local jet aloft. Uh, there may be an intersection of the dry line with horizontal convective rolls. So you must be able to measure the, the um, uh, wind field in the vicinity of these hor horizontal convective rolls. Are there other types of instabilities that are occurring that need to be documented? We also have a phenomenon called 6 o'clock magic, which Roger uh, can remember. We experienced on Saturday afternoon. We sat around the uh, western Texas panhandle all day long, and absolutely nothing happened. And then at two minutes of 6, the storms went up. A perfect case of 6 o'clock magic. Why, why, what is 6 o'clock magic? We see it over and over again. This is 6 local time magic. This probably has something to do with the planetary boundary layer oscillation or the cessation of mixing as the uh, heating from the sun uh, begins to go on the wane. This needs to be studied. Cell genealogy. There's tremendous complexity in storm evolution. Uh, we need to know not only something about the location of the formation of convective storms, but how they're organized. Do they start as individual cells, or do they start as a line? If they start as cells, what determines the spacing of the cells? I don't think we have any theory for this yet. Supercells usually split. We've known about this for over 20 years, and we understand why they split. But when we have a series of cells along a line, we get neighboring cell interaction. This is also something that needs to be studied. The lower right-hand corner, I'll show you a Doppler radar picture that we took with our UMass mobile Doppler radar of the Greensburg, Kansas tornadic, tornadic supercell in 2007. Some of you may remember Greensburg, Kansas was the place that nearly got wiped out by a tornado. And there you see the hook echo with the eye of the tornado. And I went back and I traced the Greensburg, Kansas storm to where it came from. What was its parent? And I want to point out the incredible complexity here. If we ever want to forecast an event like this, this is what needs to be taken into account. We had a mother storm, A. There was a merger with cell C. A begat B, D, G, and L. Those are all left splits off of A. Then the left split cells, two of them, then split again, producing more left split cells. Then those second generation or second generation cells, those split again to become new left moving splits. And then finally, this fourth generation left moving split, which we were watching, all of a sudden, a new storm formed in its southwest flank. That became Storm N, and that developed into the Greensburg storm. What's going on here? How can we predict when storms will have multiple splits, and when some of these third or fourth or nth generation splits will go on to produce big tornadic supercells. Major challenge. This is, for example, is a splitting storm from uh, last week in Kansas. There's the left mover, the right mover. This looks exactly like the numerical simulations. There are the outflow boundaries. There's the hook and the right mover. We were there. Now, this is an isolated right mover and left mover. But when neighboring storms are split and there are collisions, you get important consequences. This is a case from Sunday. This is a case from Saturday. That's Sunday UTC, in the Texas Panhandle. I want to point out the complexity here. This is a left moving storm that then uh, split, producing a right mover. This produced baseball size hail. This is the original storm. This is the original right mover, which then split again to produce another left mover. These two cells are left moving splits from storms that originated in this region. And out of all this convection, the storm that we were focused on was this guy which then died because it collided with a subsequent storm. Very, very complicated and a real challenge. Um, to study the environment over which storms form and move, we need to use mesonets. This is the Oklahoma mesonet, one of many that are out there now. Measurements are made of air temperature, humidity, and so on. Uh, some of the other more exotic measurements that I think are very important are the skin temperature, uh, the soil heat flux, I don't know why it was retired in 2006, uh, but we need to measure the soil moisture, 
and fluxes. Another instrument that we use to map out the environment around the storm is the mobile mesonet. This made its first appearance during Vortex 1, and uh, there's a picture of the mobile mesonet back in 1999. That can't be right. That should be 1995. And it looks pretty similar to this right now. Um, but from this, we were able to uh, get these cars with the instruments at various places around hook echoes and storm. This is from Vortex uh, from about a week and a half ago. And there's the radar echo. And it may be hard for you to see, but we P1 is probe 1, and P4 is probe 4. And you see that these, these represent measurements that are made in various locations with respect to the, the storm. So getting out around the storm and driving through it safely, making thermodynamic measurements and wind measurements is very important. Another type of instrument uh, that uh, Lee, uh, uh, Tim Samaras has used are these little hardened, hardened things called HITPRs that are placed in, in a path of tornadoes. Obviously, this is a, an easier way to saturate the region around a tornado or a storm uh, with pods that make measurements. This, by the way, is a measurement in a tornado made uh, back in, I think, 2003. And you, the, the, uh, the black line represents the pressure measurements. You can see they get a pressure drop of uh, about 100, almost 100 millibars here in the tornado. Another way we can get observations, take an airplane. You all know about this. Uh, airplane, airplane measures uh, wind, temperature, and so on. This gets radioed back. This is the, the A cars. Um, unmanned, or I'm sorry, unpersoned uh, aerial vehicles um, like this. There's the aerosan that's used for hurricanes. Uh, there is a, 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 un, an unpersoned uh, vehicle that we hope to use in Vortex 1, Vortex 2. Part one, and we couldn't get it. FAA clearance wasn't uh, approved. Hopefully, it'll come in, in year two. But you want to make thermodynamic measurements above the ground around the storm. Uh, you need more than just the ground-based measurements and probes. So you can take an airplane, small airplane, fly it around and make measurements. Storm-penetrating aircraft. You're going to see in just a few minutes that knowing what the three-dimensional structure is of the hydrometeors in a storm is very important. And we do this using radar, but getting verification for the radar is nearly impossible. One way to do that is to get a penetrating aircraft. GPS drop signs here at NCAR are very useful for getting a detailed uh, vertical thermodynamic information. And uh, if you drop it from an airplane, of course, uh, horizontal resolution is determined by how fast the aircraft is flying and how frequently the drop signs can be dropped. So sound until you drop uses multiple frequencies. There is a, an analysis made from the uh, uh, NCAR uh, drop signs. The airplane flew by, and you can then go ahead and analyze, analyze the measurements. And you can see that there's a dry line in this region uh, and uh, a wind shift. Uh, and you can see how deep the wind shift is and so on. Really beautiful, detailed measurements, both of the wind field and of the thermodynamic fields that, that, that need to be done. Uh, how many of you are old enough to remember the fire sign theater? How can you be in two places at once when you're not anywhere at all? The younger people don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe some of the old people don't know what I'm talking about either. But you need to make measurements in a lot of different places. So uh, in situ observations, you can't be everywhere simultaneously. Maybe some people can. Most of us can't. Uh, you use ground-based mobile and airborne platforms, and it can be in a lot of places, but not all simultaneously. Remote sensing can be in a lot of places almost simultaneously. It takes a bit more time with mechanical scanning, much faster with electronic scanning. Range uh, limited. Uh, you can mount uh, your instruments on ground-based mobile or airborne platforms. Thermodynamic variables are a significant challenge. The wind variables are easier. So remote sensing of the wind is something that's relatively easy, and we do it with Doppler radar. But remote sensing of thermodynamic variables, that is a key challenge. Uh, rad radars, uh, I don't know, uh, there are probably various backgrounds out here, so just a very, very quick review. Uh, we mainly look at Rayleigh or Mie scattering by precipitation, insects, and so on. Here are the different uh, radars that we use from S-band or 10 centimeter all the way down to 3 millimeter or W-band. 
the NEXRAD and research radars uh, operate at S band, and they're not very sensitive to attenuation, but you need a giant antenna uh, if you want to have a very narrow beam width. So these radars are not transportable or, or mobile. Uh, if you get down to X band, uh, the Doppler and wheels and many research Doppler radars, this is sort of a, a, a compromise because you can get an antenna which has a relatively uh, narrow beam uh, that's small enough that you can mount on a truck, but you do have some attenuation problems. You get down to three millimeters, W band, uh, that's a tornado radar, and we've been using one of these from the University of Massachusetts, and this radar has a very, very narrow beam width, but it attenuates severely. If you take it near a tornado and there's rain, you don't see very far. Uh, you need to consider the size of the scatterers. Uh, I'm gonna skip all this uh, since I just mentioned it. Doppler radar only gets the wind component along the beams, the radial component. And the radars scan in quasi-horizontal cones. Vertical velocity is not resolved directly. The radar looks out like this. You don't measure very much of the vertical velocity. So how do you get the vertical velocity? What you need to do is get the horizontal wind field and then use the equation of continuity to get the vertical velocity. And there are a lot of problems in doing this. Um, Pulse repetition frequency uh, gives you the range and velocity folding, so we need to correct for range and velocity folding. There's a trade-off between range and velocity folding known as the Doppler dilemma. Uh, there are techniques to mitigate the folding problems, usually involving multiple pulse repetition frequencies. Uh, there are alternatives to pulse radar. You can use FMCW pulse compression, uh, and you have a sensitivity uh, versus resolution versus Doppler dilemma issues. How do you get the other components of the wind? Uh, well, one way you can take a VAD, velocity azimuth display. Uh, this was originally done by Dave Atlas. You take the radar, you scan it around a cone. You assume that the air motions are homogeneous over that, that region. And uh, you get a sine wave. If you look out and you see uh, into the wind, uh, you see the air coming towards you. You get a, you get a negative, a, ma a maximum in, in, in motions coming towards you. You sit around 180 degrees and you get a maximum you get a sine wave. So you can use that to get the, the wind profile. You can use the ground-based velocity track display, Wen Shao Li, uh, which is a variation on the VAD. You can use dual or multiple Doppler radar analysis, uh, and you just get two different radars looking at your storm from two different viewing angles, and then you can then synthesize uh, the wind field. Spaced antenna. Uh, spaced antenna, Guifu Zhang is in the audience, uh, and Steve Cohn. I think, um, spaced antenna uh, allows you to actually get the component of the wind that's normal to the beam. And uh, there are issues of correlating between two different antenna elements. I'll say a few words about that in another, minute, another uh, few minutes. You can also use TREK, tracking radar echoes by correlation, Ron Reinhardt, uh, in which you go ahead and, and track um, uh, structure in the, in the reflectivity field uh, from series of scans, and from that, uh, you try to get uh, an estimate of the two-dimensional wind. You have problems with vertical evection, and so you need a rapid scan radar if you want to go ahead and really apply this if you're in a convective storm. You can place a Doppler radar on board an airplane. Uh, I have a picture of the P3 during Vortex 1, and Eldora, the NCAR plane, uh, looks quite similar to this. The uh, radar antenna is mounted in the, in the uh, tail of the uh, plane, and this type of airplane goes into tropical cyclones every year. This is an airborne dual Doppler analysis of a tornadic uh, supercell during Vortex 1. And there's the rear flank gust front and the mesocyclone, and then T4 is the fourth tornado. This is a mobile x band radar. This is from the University of Massachusetts. I saw that the Dow, one of the Dows was parked out in back which is a bigger, more powerful version of this. And there's my, one of my graduate students. Looks as if he's milking the antenna. <laughs> I don't know. And this is just a typical image that we get from this radar. This is from a few years ago. And this is a, uh, this, is, this was an interesting supercell. Uh, that eye represents the center of the tornado. And there was also an anticyclonic tornado down the other side a little bit later. I don't have time to talk about this right now, but interesting scientific questions are, of course, what forms tornadoes? Why are, some, why are most cyclonic? Why are some anticyclonic? 
how can you get an anticyclonic tornado? This is a dual Doppler analysis uh, that we've done uh, using the UMass uh, uh, X-band radar and one of the five centimeter smart R radars. And there you see the hook echo, that's the reflectivity, and there's the mesocyclone. And you can also uh, use the airborne Doppler radars in clear air. This is from IHOP, and this shows uh, multiple Doppler analyses of a boundary. And I'm sorry, but the credit got chopped off. Forget where I got that from. Here's a W-band mobile radar from University of Massachusetts. We've been using this for years. And this has an antenna beam width of 0 0.18 degrees, just fine as you get. Most X-band radars have uh, uh, half power beam widths on the order of a degree or so. And this is what sort of data that you get when you scan, take an RHI, a vertical scan through a tornado. It's hollow. It closes up right near the, the lowest uh, 10 or 20 meters of the ground. And we also see these horizontal vortices, yellow to, yellow to purple, uh, white to purple. These, this is, these represent horizontal rolls along the side of the tornado. And we also have a jet of outflow, which slopes down. These are substructures within the tornado, some of which have been seen in large eddy simulations. So we're trying to understand what these mean. Um, there are a sequence of images that we took a number of years ago, PPIs, roughly every 10 to 15 seconds, but only at one elevation angle uh, through a tornado. And you can see the, the hole, the eye in the middle of the tornado. And if you just go ahead, very short periods of time, uh, this, for example, represents 13 seconds between this image and that image. We start to see notches, then we see two eyes, then we see bands, then we see two notches. And then all of a sudden, everything fades away. And I think what you come away with here is that in just 10 or 15 seconds, there's a tremendous change in the appearance of the tornado on radar. So you need to, if you want to study a tornado, you need to rapidly update your, your radar, your, your volume scan. This is the, um, the I used to think that stood for monthly weather review, but it's meteorological weather radar. I didn't make the name up. Um, that Bob Luth has provided with us. This is a mobile X-band phased array radar. It's a hybrid electronically scanning, mechanically scanning radar. Uh, it's composed of many uh, antenna elements. And uh, by changing the phases of each element, you can point the beam in different directions. So the antenna scans electronically, not mechanically. Uh, now, uh, actually, this is a hybrid. Uh, the antenna scans around rapidly 180 degrees a second. So it goes around one complete revolution every two seconds. It goes around like a bat out of hell. You don't want to get near this while it's whipping around. Um, but what you do is, as the antenna is going around very, very quickly, uh, the radar scans electronically in elevation angle. So you're seeing everything in the vertical plane just about at once. In addition to that, the radar scans electronically in the direction opposite to that which the antenna is rotating. So you, you, you essentially fix the beam in space. And then you transmit at 10 different frequencies. And lo and behold, you're able to get a, a, a really good picture uh, of the uh, Doppler velocities and reflectivities. We've been, we use this this year in uh, Vortex. And we, we have data from this year and last year in which we have the complete life cycle of tornadoes. Um, last year, we got about a 15 second update. This year, we, we got it down to seven seconds. So every seven seconds, you're looking at the uh, wind field in the tornado. Oops. The, this is a, what the uh, rapid scan radar looks like scanning a, a wall cloud. This is probably about five days ago. Now, if I hit command, command tab, whoop, command tab, OK, and then I just click on this once. Refresh button, I forget. This is, uh, Bob Bluth just gave this to me. And this is a, a tornado. And it appears to be, that's Doppler velocity and that's reflectivity. It's jiggling back and forth because there's, there's uh, 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 because of the, 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 the inertia of the antenna. The position is going to be corrected. But you can follow the difference in the, dop in the dipole in the tornado. Uh, and there's the eye in the tornado. And we actually have data covering the entire volume of the, most of the volume of the storm from well before the tornado formed until well after the tornado dissipated. 45 minutes worth of data. And I just do, and we go back. Okay. It worked. 
Other interesting mesoscale problems involving uh, precipitation. Gravity waves. This is from a paper by Sanders and Bozart. Pressure plotted on the uh, ordinate, time plotted on the abscissa. And you can see that we, uh, the winds are from the northeast. The pressure goes up. It then plummets and then jumps up tremendously as the wind shifts. And we see this at a number of different observing stations. This has very, very important consequences for precipitation in winter storms. Is there a type of gravity wave? How do we go ahead and measure what's happening in the gravity wave, an observational challenge? How can we predict when these gravity waves are going to occur? Uh, this is from uh, an instrument called the ARI. I'll talk about it in, in a minute. Uh, and there you see the water vapor mixing ratio as a function of height, as a function of time, and the potential temperature as a function of height and as a function of time. And you can do time to space conversion, and you can learn something about um, Bohr's solitary gravity waves uh, and, and look at the uh, way the potential temperature varies and the water vapor mixing ratio varies. You can sort of see that um, you can kind of guess that when, you have the, when you're in the upward part of the bore, when there's upward motion, you get an increase in water vapor mixing ratio. And when you're in the sinking uh, part of the bore, you get a decrease. And this, of course, has consequences for convective initiation. Dual polarization radar. Again, how can you be in many different places at once? It's very important to know something about the um, hydrometeor distribution in a convective storm, uh, other than trying to predict what kind of precipitation you're getting or how much you're getting. Um, the nature of the precipitation is very important because as it falls into unsaturated air, you get cooling. And the amount of cooling that you get can have a pr profound effect on the subsequent dynamics of the system. So how do you do this? You send out horizontally and vertically polarized channels, uh, and uh, you get back different amplitudes. And you, and you find out that the phase depends on the type of target, small raindrops, large rain droplets, hail, ice crystals, and so on. Large raindrops, for example, as they fall, uh, become elongated. And so you get more radiation back in the horizontal plane than you get in the vertical plane. You also get a phase difference. It's useful for classifying hydrometeor types and precipitation estimation. Um, also, you can uh, uh, identify ground clutter and remove it. Some of the uh, parameters that we get using a, a parametric radar are ZDR, differential reflectivity, sort of a measure of the horizontal out, horizontal back, to vertical out, to vertical back. KDP, which is a specific differential phase. This is the, the range, the derivative with respect to range uh, of the actual phase difference between the uh, uh, horizontal and vertically polarized beams. And the nice thing about KDP, or these phase measurements, is that they're independent of attenuation, as long as you have a strong enough signal to make the measurements. So if you go out with an X-band radar, uh, you're going to have tremendous attenuation problems, but you can still make good measurements by looking at the phase. And then rho H feed the cross-correlation coefficient. Uh, this is some work done by Alexander Rishkoff, and this is the radar reflectivity in a supercell storm. This is the differential reflectivity in dB. I won't try to interpret this for you, but you can see there are different, different values there. They mean different things. And uh, based on the differential reflectivity and cross-correlation coefficient and KDP, which I'm not showing you, uh, they were able to actually classify what type of hydrometeor we have within the storm. Do we have rain? Do we have hail? Large drops, small drops, um, cows, uh, biological scatterers. I guess a cow would be a biological scatterer. Insects. We uh, have made measurements in tornadoes with a polar metric radar. At the top, you see the radar reflectivity. And there's a ring of enhanced reflectivity in the center of the tornado. There's the dipole, the vortex couplet from red to blue. And then there's a spiral band of enhanced reflectivity going around that central um, uh, ring. But it turns out that the area encompassing this central ring has a low value of ZDR, that's what the green means, and a low value of rho HV, that's what the green means. And it turns out low ZDR and low rho HV mean debris rather than rain. So we're actually able to look into the tornado and say that spiral band is composed of rain, and that inner ring is the debris cloud. And we have a picture of the debris cloud and the tornado. And lo and behold, you'll have to trust me. 
that the width of the debris cloud is just about the same as the width of this debris ring or this region of low uh, uh, ZDR and rho HV. We can also look into a hook echo. Um, my graduate student has, is just about to submit this paper, but there's the hook echo with an eye where the tornado is, and there's ZDR. I won't point out all the features. There's rho HV, Doppler velocity, but using fuzzy logic, he's able to uh, come out with a hydrometeor classification. Uh, this red and orange, for example, the orange is heavy rain. Um, the red is rain and hail. And the green biological scatterer is at the edge. And the rain is just, um, the regular rain is yellow. And so you can actually see that around the tornado, we have mostly regular rain with kind of a band of heavy rain spiraling around the tornado. I'm being a little bit glib here. It's difficult to go and verify this. <laughs> So this may be wrong, but at least makes qualitative physical sense. Dual polarized uh, spaced antenna. Uh, this was a, a, a technique where you take two antennas close to each other, and um, you try to get the wind component normal to the radar beam. Uh, we originally tried to do this using an, a, a, electron, a mechanically scanning radar. Turned out that the radar was, was misdesigned. This is probably best for electronic scanning. Uh, if you imagine that you have a mechanically scanning radar going around, uh, if you go out to a reasonable range, the motion of the antenna is going to be much greater than the actual wind motion you're trying to measure. So to do try this technique, you really need to use electronic scanning. The resolution is relatively coarse, but it obviates the need for dual Doppler lobes. So if we can solve this challenge, we'll be able to go out with a Doppler radar, just one Doppler radar, you won't need to have a network, and you'll actually be able to get two-dimensional measurements of the wind. There's the spaced antenna, so it was several years ago. There's the current operational uh, radar system, uh, the net, next red network. And uh, because of Earth's curvature, as you get relatively far out, you don't see what's happening in the boundary layer. So uh, we consider CASA, the Center for Adaptive Sensing of the Atmosphere. This is a, uh, uh, an engineering research center. Uh, project in which there are uh, low-powered radars spaced rather close to each other. So instead of having a, a network of widely spaced, really powerful radars, you have a small network of low-powered radars. And the advantage of this type of system is that all the radars can see in the boundary layer. There are a lot more issues uh, that, that one can, can talk about here, but uh, one can consider uh, what's the relative merit of blanketing the uh, United States or an area with low-powered, less expensive radars uh, that can see in the boundary layer where a lot of the action is happening? In the future, the mechanically scanning antennas, these are radars are mounted on small towers like this, and hopefully uh, electronically scanning antennas will be placed in. OK, I, I mentioned earlier the problem of how do you measure uh, thermodynamic variables remotely. One way to do that is to use the refractive index. Um, so you actually send out a, a, a radar beam, and it comes back. And you can measure the phase of, that, uh, uh, the, the, phase of the returning uh, beam. And it turns out that that is a function of n for, for a target that's at a fixed distance r and a fixed frequency f. And as far as I know, the speed of sound is constant. Uh, that this phase will depend on n, which is the refractivity um, index of refractivity. And it turns out that n, the index of refractivity, is a function of, of the amount of water vapor, that's vapor pressure, temperature, and pressure. And the contribution to the spatial variability in the index of refraction is such that very, very small amount is due to pressure. A reasonable amount is due to temperature. And most is due to, about 3 quarters is due to the water vapor. So here is um, uh, a line of towering cumulus forming. This is the measurements of the refractivity, index of refractivity. And you can see that there's a gradient in the index of refractivity. Uh, this is normal radar coverage. You go out to 150 kilometers. If you use this 
this refractivity technique, uh, you can only see a very, very small portion of that large echo. So in other words, this technique is good for uh, seeing the variations in index of refraction, temperature, and humidity fairly close to the radar. So uh, Frederick Fabry said it's like looking through a keyhole. Uh, profilers. Doppler wind profilers. Non-scanning radar. Uh, we use Bragg scattering uh, in, in the clear air. Uh, if, there is, uh, if, if there are also uh, precipitation particles and so on, then we get Rayleigh scattering. We can also use the radio acoustic sounding system. Uh, that uh, uh, basis of that is that the speed of sound is proportional, is a function of the virtual temperature. So if you measure um, uh, the time it takes the beam to come back, that tells you something about the virtual temperature profile, another way of remote sensing uh, virtual temperature. Now, the, mo the profiling systems are very useful if you can make them mobile. This is the MIPS, the Mobile Integrated Profiling System that Kevin Nupp has at University of Alabama, and NCAR has its own version called MISS. LIDARs, boy, I'm, time flies quickly. Um, LIDARs are nice, they're, they're laser uh, Doppler radars. You get extremely narrow uh, collinear beams. They don't spread out, uh, but they can see, uh, they get backscattering uh, from, uh, uh, from particles in the atmosphere, and you don't have to worry. You can see through the clear air. You get scattering from the molecules. Um, we have, I'm going to say that there are three different types of LIDARs. Uh, there are the Raman LIDARs, Raman LIDARs, water vapor. Uh, is, uh, we get Raman scattering, and uh, from that you can get information about the liquid water and aerosols. There's the differential absorption LIDAR, or the dial, uh, and uh, you can use that uh, to get information uh, about the um, water vapor. Then you can, get make, uh, you can Dopplerize a, a, a LIDAR and get the wind in the clear air. This type of an instrument is going to be added to the phased array radar, that I sh the mobile phased array radar I showed you just a little while ago. This is some work that I did with a student back in the early 1980s. This is um, from an airborne Doppler LIDAR that, that NASA had in an airplane. and We flew by a gust front. And there in clear air, you can get the, the two-dimensional winds. And right along the gust front, you can, you can resolve some vortices. You can't see anything behind the gust front because there's rain. So it's nice to have a Doppler LIDAR and a radar together. So you can use the LIDAR to get the clear air motions and the radar to get the motions uh, where you have precipitation. Uh, this is a plot of water vapor mixing ratio from a scanning uh, Raman LIDAR. That's the vertical. This is time. You can do some time to, to space conversion. And you can see that there are high water vapor mixing ratios, 12 grams per kilogram to the right, and lesser amounts to the left. And you can see there's a sharp gradient here. This is, I believe, a dry line. Uh, and you can see how deep the moisture is and so on. You can look at the vertical structure of these boundaries that are responsible for the formation of storms. This is Leander, a downward pointing uh, a differential absorption LIDAR. And, uh, you have the water vapor mixing ratio, and I believe you can see evidence of gravity waves uh, along the top of this boundary. So you can make visible to the eye the spatial variations in water vapor using uh, this, this technique. The atmospheric emitted radiance interferometer, or ARI device, uh, is a, um, was employed in a network in Oklahoma and Kansas. And here is a, a comparison. Uh, between the soundings at various locations, Lamont, Oklahoma, and you can see the details of the dew point and temperature, and the red represents the airy instrument. And you can see the airy instrument is smooth with respect to what we find from the Raven Sons, but we see we can get a fairly decent uh, uh, look at the uh, temperature and dew point variation with height using the interferometer. And we can take, that, take the measurements uh, there's potential temperature and mixing ratio uh, as a function of time, and you can see dry line passages and, and so on. Space uh, satellite-borne infrared spectrometers and radiometers. Uh, from those, you can invert the temperature and moisture profiles using multiple infrared detectors at different wavelengths. Uh, usually limited, uh, having to use those usually limits the vertical resolution. 
Uh, typically, you may have 15 detectors. NASA has uh, a device called AIRS that has 2,378 detectors. Now, I got this from a little while ago. Maybe they've, they've, they've done even better than this recently. But unlike the, uh, G, the um, uh, geostationary satellite, uh, this is an orbiting satellite. The measurements are only twice daily. But you can get incredible, uh, incredibly good spatial resolution, uh, 50 kilometers. And there's your accuracy of temperature and humidity. So this is very, very useful for making measurements where you can't have any instruments whatsoever. For example, over mountainous areas, over the ocean, remote parts of the, the globe. I think I was asked to emphasize the global aspects, and I didn't. There's a, there's a picture of Hurricane Isabel uh, using this device. And you can see the very high temperatures in the center of the tropical cyclones, warm core. Um, I'm getting to the last technique right now. That's the GPS MET, uh, which uses ground-based GPS receivers. And GPS MET, which uses orbiting GPS receivers uh, and active limb sounding and radio occultation. And this technique is like the Fabry refractivity technique with the Doppler radar. But instead here, uh, they use GPS signals. And this is a NOAA, uh, NOAA uh, network, a GPS MET. And uh, it's on global in scale. And here you can see um, a satellite image showing a, a strong cyclone over the upper level cyclone over the Rocky Mountains with a trailing cold front and lots of severe convection. And there uh, is the, the water vapor, a measurement of the water vapor. You can resolve the tremendous gradients and, and, and the structure um, from the, using this technique. Then there's cosmic. Uh, and COSMIC, instead of using ground-based devices and satellites, it uses satellites exclusively to go ahead and make the, make the measurements. There are some problems with GPS MET and GPS slash MET. You still can't separate the effects of temperature from the effects of water vapor. And so you might want to use a model forecast of temperature to retrieve the water vapor content. Uh, use independent temperature measurements from microwave radiometers or radio sounds. Uh, and I'm not an expert in this area, but I think clearly uh, being able to distinguish between temperature and humidity is an important, important problem. Oh, God. <laughs> um, a sub-theme, dynamics of local mesoscale flows due to changes in topography and orography, and I've listed some of them, sea breeze, land breeze, downslope, wind storms, and so on. The dynamics of these mesoscale flows are driven by the synoptic scale systems. Um, fronts and gravity waves. And just skip ahead here. Interaction of airflow with orography, a very important mesoscale problem. Uh, static stability of the air is very important. The intensity of fl uh, and the intensity of flow. Uh, a measurement of, of these two, it, it can be given in terms of the Froude number. Does the air make it up over the mountains, or is it diverted or blocked around the barrier? Very, very important. Vertical wind shear plays an important role. We can generate horizontal vortices. Some are generated baroclinically through static stability. Uh, mixed layer dynamics. Sometimes the horizontal vortices are tilted onto the vertical as air descends or ascends as it moves around mountain ranges. Here's a typical example of the so-called Denver cyclone. This is one of the best examples I could find. Uh, from this March, and it forms when the synoptic scale wind is from the southeast, and there's Broomfield, and there's Denver, and the, the air pollution, the air pollutants get trapped against the mountains. They can occur night and day. They're obviously related to orography. Uh, during the daytime, you may get a mixed layer. During the nighttime, you get a nocturnal inversion. Yet you see these both during the daytime and the nighttime, and they're sometimes the location this time of year when you get land spouts. There's the long line anticyclone. In this case, we have northwesterly flow. And then we get, instead of a, a cyclone, we get an anticyclone, again, related to orography. Here's this Catalina Eddy out over Los Angeles. And uh, uh, there you see there's a, there's a cyclone centered right near the coast of LA. It's important for forecasting air pollution and also convective storms. First time I saw a Catalina Eddy, I was looking at a, at a satellite image. And I saw a thunderstorm over the mountains of Los Angeles. And I was wondering, what is causing this? And I looked at the airflow, and I saw a cyclone. And I said, oh my god, I, this is really interesting. And there's a satellite image. You can see actually two, two, uh, 
two little eddies, cyclonic eddies, in the stratocumulus off the coast of LA. Where do thunderstorms form with respect to orography? Uh, do they form on the windward side due to orographic lift? Do they form on the lee side when air comes over the mountains and collides with, with uh, an anabatic wind? Uh, is there channeling? Uh, are there wake effects as air is diverted around the mountains? Again, does the air make it up over the mountains, or is it diverted around the mountains? Very important questions that need to be answered. What kind of instruments do you need to make these measurements? Uh, radars have a lot of problems with, with mountains. You have to be really clever how you use a radar near a mountain. Coastal front, New England coastal front. I took this from this year, no, no 2005. Easterly winds, warm. Inland, northerly winds, colder and snowing. You get cold air damming, the air comes in from the east, can't make it up over the Appalachians, goes with the pressure gradient off to the south. The warm, moist air comes and rides up and over, and you have a warm ocean, that's the source of the warm air. It's a, it's a toasty upper 30s. And you get heavy precipitation. Here is what I call the inland coastal front. And I experienced this here in Boulder this, this, this winter. This is back in March during a big snowstorm. Easterly winds. Air is too stable to make it up and over the mountains, so it turns sharply to the left, and we get a barrier jet, and you get an enhancement of precipitation uh, east of the mountains as the air rides, and up, uh, rides up and over the mountains. So here the question, to the, the answer to the question, if you get air coming in from the east, where's the maximum precipitation? Well, in this case, it's not over the mountains. It's actually east of the mountains because of the barrier jet. Another important effect that needs to be understood. Here, by the way, is a, another case where we had a Denver cyclone, and there's precipitation, and the precipitation actually forms what looks like a hook echo in spirals, spiral bands. Um, again, if we mountains, this is from MAP, the Mesoscale Alpine Project. Um, if air is unblocked and unstable, it just comes right up over the mountains. Or it can be stable and blocked, in which case it doesn't make it up over the mountains, and the nature of the precipitation is different. The microphysics, kinematics, all different. Skip this. Here's an example of KH waves. Can KH wave modulate precipitation? Some work that a, that a student and I are doing, and there you see a, an image from the CASA radars uh, and from the NSSL polar metric radar. And in the wind field, you see these regularly spaced bands of reflect, in, in Doppler velocity that indicate KH waves. We can, how do we look at the boundary layer on the mesoscale? We can make a, we can make a distributed array of boundary layer instruments, sort of a, meso, a mesonet for, uh, uh, of towers. Let me summarize. We have a number of mesoscale observing systems, different types of platforms, fixed site, transportable, towed on a trailer and then set up, mobile. We have airborne and ground-based, and then we have satellite. And they're just a whole shopping list of the different type of instruments that we have that need to be refined or developed further. Challenge of the new observing systems. Improve the measurements of 3D winds, especially a vertical velocity, which is usually normal to the radar beam, or only a very small component of which, the, uh, which is along the radar beam. We need to measure the thermodynamic variables remotely. We need to develop new techniques. We need to separate the delay effects of temperature from those of water vapor. New techniques. Cloud physics, in situ and remote measurements. Big challenge. Dual pole rapid scan radar. Uh, we need to improve the vertical resolution of satellite sounding systems. We need to increase the coverage, increase the frequency of observations, integrate measurements. And I'm going to skip down to two important things here. Uh, we need to do quality control rapidly. Uh, when we edit Doppler radar data, it's a very time consuming process. When we have rapid scan data, we get 10 times as much data and it drives graduate students and other people crazy. So we need to develop new techniques for editing the data. Finally, university faculty seem to have difficulty to develop instruments. It takes a lot of time. And uh, if you work in an instrument for a long time, you don't get many papers published. And uh, that affects the tenure process. And we need to have incentives for faculty that want to develop instrumentation. And this is a hard day of data collection. That's Mad Magazine, for those of you that can't see in the back. Thank you. I think I've okay. 
questions for Howie. Got a few minutes? None for Howie? Steve. Uh -oh. <laughs> ah, good. Yeah, the person who funds them. Of course, going to ask a question. <laughs> uh, Steve Nelson, NSF. All right, Howie, you've listed a gazillion instruments up there. What are we missing? Or are we missing anything? What are we missing? What you observe uh, uh, at, at the moment. Uh, I mean, you mentioned W, but uh, I don't think the Doppler radar is going to help you that much unless you get triple Doppler. Yeah. So, is there any observation that you really would like that you can't do with this? Yeah, well, vertical velocity, one way you can measure vertical velocity is to use an aircraft that scans over. Am I not turned on? Uh, you can use a, uh, a radar that scans vertically. You can fly above the, above the convection. But you then have to, separate, you have to separate the terminal fall velocity from the air motion. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what sort of clever techniques people may may think of. Um, you could take as a, you could use a spaced antenna and aim it horizontally and get the vertical beam uh, from the orthogonal, uh, let me say, try to say that clearly. You can take a, a spaced antenna and you can point it horizontally and get the vertical, uh, the vertical velocity, but then again you still have the problem of separating hydrometeor uh, fall velocity from, from the air motion. Uh, that, that's a challenge. Uh, getting the hydrometeors everywhere in the storm is a challenge. Or let me say verifying what all the hydrometeors are. You can use a polarimetric radar to estimate or to guess what the vertical distribution of hydrometeors is, but how do you go out and verify it? You can send in a storm penetrating aircraft, but that storm penetrating aircraft can only go in it can't be everywhere in the storm at once. So how can you verify that what you're seeing is real? Uh, that's a tremendous challenge, I would say. Uh, measuring the vertical distribution of, of temperature and humidity and getting it on a, on a, on a storm or substorm scale is quite a challenge. But Steve, you asked, what is it that we absolutely can't measure? And I think at all. Yeah. Yes. I, I would have thought that a thing to add to this is that the uh, severe weather meteorology isn't just the uh, remote sensing, that if you really had a radar aircraft that also had chemical tracers, that had good air, uh, aerosol measurements, that could measure cloud physics and so on, uh, that um, could measure the drag over the ocean and so on, that you would be far better off by combining some of those things on the same platform. Integrated, integrated platforms, integrated systems on, on platforms. Yeah, actually you had one bullet there that you didn't cover, which I agreed with. We, we almost have gone perhaps a tinge too far into wind measurements. And you said I trade, I think the line said I'll trade one measurement for right. a couple of thermodynamic measurements. I think that's where we're really hurting and missing. Questions? Yeah, Bernie. Uh, it's often said that uh, you know rainfall at all different scales is a fundamental measurement for hydrology, flash flood forecasting. I mean, it's a, one of the most important measurements from space, for example, and even from the ground. Um, in terms of the uh, the drop size distribution, which governs the rain rate, of course, um, what would be your indication as as to what is the smallest uh, convective scale or spatial distribution of uh, rainfall that we have to look at? Okay. Is it 100 meters, is it 50 meters, or, or can we look at a kilometer uh, in terms of the, con you talk about convective scales and so on. If I, if I had to uh, deploy a dense distrometer network, what kind of spacing would I need to capture the essence of the spatial structure of rainfall, or rain rate, or the drop size distribution parameters, for example? That's a good question. Um, what, what's the smallest spatial scale that we need to measure rainfall? And of course, that depends upon what problem you're looking at. Um, if you're looking, for example, at a supercell where we can get a rain curtain wrapping around uh, a tornado, we have measurements, radar measurements with a W-band radar that show the rain curtain can be as narrow as 10 meters. So it's possible 
to have heavy rain falling over a 10-meter a ten swath. You can see this if you drive out, drive in your car sometimes through some storm, and you'll find that uh, over a distance of just 10 meters, you'll see a, a, a tremendous di uh, difference in the amount of rain. From a practical standpoint, though, I would question whether or not you need to have rainfall measurements on that scale because it, the rain all falls into a basin, and I think that that acts as a low-pass filter, doesn't it? So you can have heavy rain over here and light rain over here, but it all flows off in one, one direction. So I'm not an expert on, on rainfall estimation, but I would say that in a storm, the actual spatial variations in rainfall rate can be as small as 10 meters. Whether or not you actually need measurements on that scale to come up with a meaningful, something that's meaningful for hydrologists, I, I would question. Yeah, Jacob. Hi, I was wondering if you could design your preferred Doppler on wheels. You know, it's, I can't remember which letters go with, with, with which bands, but apparently the 10 centimeter wavelength is too much for a truck. But if you could, would you, would you like to have three wavelengths, dual polarization on each, on phase sensing? What would be the radar that would be practical to, to measure some of these things? And not because you're fun limited. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it'd be great to have a 10 centimeter radar that somehow gave, had a one degree beam width or less. You're uh, talking about the mobile house. The what? The mobile house. The mobile house. Unless some clever person can figure out a way to get blood from a stone, if you can figure out how to make an antenna that's small at S band and still get a fine beam width, uh, uh, that would be a tremendous challenge. I don't know if it's impossible or if it's just something that, that we're just, we just haven't arrived at. Certainly having radars at two different frequencies and knowing that the attenuation characteristics are different at those two frequencies, that tells you a lot about the nature of the, the hydrometeors that are, that are out there. It would be nice to have uh, uh, everything dual polarized. So a, 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 a dual or multiple frequency antenna. Uh, each antenna that's, that's, that's matched to the same beam width each of which is a spaced antenna, so that you can see the uh, air motions normal to the beam. I'm asking for an awful lot here, but that would be my ideal radar platform. Always wanted to know that. <laughs> okay, we're coming up to five o'clock. Let's thank uh, Howie. Great presentation.